fragmented and segmented and fragmented and welcome to these are my friends dan's my friend you're my friend all the people in the world are my friends my friend anybody's listening (laughs) this is the podcast for people who have those late night conversations where you're kind of like stoned maybe a little maybe a little wobbly popped and you just have these trippy conversations about stuff and then you're like afterwards you don't really know what you talked about but you're just like shit dude we should have recorded that that was dope but a little bit more coherent no and maybe maybe a little less coherent, but these are the ones that were recorded and were coming at your ear holes. I'm usually not conscious during these uh, podcasts, uh, <laughs> kind of like the people in Dylan's first story who were in a in various stages of coma. They were they were they were coma patients, and the experience they had it, it kind of changes your outlook on life and exactly what's going on. It's quite trippy when you're out of reality for a moment or what feels like a moment and you come back uh then we go into a very weird segment as well that led to a stan salvia trip explain that a little bit (laughs) i'm pretty sure i think i've talked about it before but yeah anyway (laughs) it was a weird time then we go into stream of consciousness stories from my brain to my tongue to your ears out of my uh head instantly to your from my heart to your uh to your heart Mm -hmm. and uh there was no rewrites there was no editing it was just a stream of conscious storytelling which then goes into da, 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 new segment, human error, human, human error, human error. What do we do with that, Dan? Where people do dumb stuff and we get to showcase it. This one was stupid ideas, real inventions that tried to come out of the market or was on the market, but not for very long for good purposes. Some, some dumb ideas that people just went ahead and made them anyway. Yep. They said, I got an idea because I'm bored and I want to be famous. And even, they didn't really have a good idea. Even the layman, me, could see right away that those ideas would be foolish and mm-hmm. yet they still went through with them. So... All I'm going to say, all I'm going to say, oh, this is all he's going to say. All I'm going to say, oh, baby catapult. Dan. D. How you doing? Good, bud. How you doing? You know, life's good. Life's good right now. We got some crazy, uh, momentous stories in the old planner. Um, Have we? To talk about. Momentous stories. Yeah. The likes of which to rival the fall of Babylon. It will, it will uh, amaze and shock you. But first, uh, I have some stories to introduce to you about some hospital miracle fixing stuff. Hospital miracle fixing stuff. That's quite the adjective, miracle of oh miracles. God, I was just making sure you're paying attention, and uh, you, you passed. Whoops. <laughs> Actually, it's not. It's about comas. Is that a pass or fail? You, no, like... you passed. Uh, you nailed it. All right. Okay. How do you feel? How do you feel? Just think of your entire... Just close your eyes. How do you feel? Yellow. Okay. There you go. I was not what I expected. Like afraid? <laughs> no. Cowardly? Like urination. You have to go pee. No, I just did You've, it. You've soiled yourself. <laughs> right now, I'm doing it. <laughs> Soiling yourself. It's a it's a tense thing. Pick a color. Uh, Between one and ten. Um, seven. <laughs> Blue. <laughs> A blue seven. <laughs> Nailed it. Which is weird because sevens are always red in my head. Dark red. Anyway. We've, we've, we've discussed this before, I think. Yeah. Yes? Okay, so. How are you doing, Dan? You're having a great uh, Thursday. Yeah, it's Wrong. fine. Yeah, it's it's fine. Go ahead and try to <laughs> it's ask a better, me how It's a better doing. Friday, though. It's a normal question. I'm doing fine. <laughs> doing fine. Yeah. Yes. Okay, well, these people all are doing fine now, but weren't doing fine previously. I'm going to open this up with a little bit of... Uh, Kind of crazy stories about people in coma and what they experienced. Oh. Going through the old coma uh, revival and uh, being there, but not. You're present, but your almost paralysis is taken over. I don't know. It seems like a dream. Okay. So um, this is the this is a story. This is all coming from BuzzFeed, by the way. So I got to give uh, kudos to where I'm ripping this off of. But it's it's past and it's awesome. The buzz. Yes, we're putting we're we're putting the buzz on the map for <laughs> for for Victoria. In You're Saanich. welcome, BuzzFeed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this story goes: I was in a coma last year. Coming out of it was just like waking up normally, but I thought it was being held against my will by a corrupt doctor. I even hallucinated that the doctor's niece was in my bed, hiding from him too. I tried to tell the staff, and even though I knew it wasn't completely illogical, it felt so real. Eventually, a nurse came in, in a damn hazmat suit, and said, You were on a ventilator and in a coma for a month. You have COVID. You can't move because your muscles are atrophied. Nothing is holding you down. Look. She showed me everything, and I snapped out of it. According to my mom, she called every day and talked to me on speakerphone. The nurse said 
I nod along with what she was saying. So I guess I heard the things, but don't remember. Whoa. How trippy is that? So and that's she, a real story that someone wrote. Is like a- when you have a dream, you're, I mean, a sense of time is all lost, correct? Like for you? It's warped. It's, it's absolutely it's, different than when we're awake. Even when we're awake, it could, it could be various, but yeah, it varied, but yeah. Sometimes I feel like I wake up and I'm like, whoa, I was gone to the REM world mm. for ever. Your subconscious. It just felt like forever. But then sometimes I wake up and I'm like, holy crap. I, I literally feel like I rolled over and went to bed like you blinked. A, an hour ago. Yeah. And now I'm, I'm waking up and starting my day. Like, hmm. so uh, imagine doing that kind of that feeling for a month. That blink feeling. Yeah. Like, hmm. isn't that kind of just it's it's terrifying trippy. really to think that you could lose that much time just without really being aware that it's happened. Like for so long that your muscles are atrophied. Like that's kind of, yeah. or I guess a month. I don't know. I can kind of, I've had a few different experiences that I can relate to that a little bit in the sense that when I was young, I had uh, an operation. And so I remember the anesthetic feeling where they were like, if you can count all the way to 20 by the time, you know, then who knows whether you, you win or whatever. Nobody can do it. Nobody can usually get to 20. And then I'm like, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. <laughs> sleep completely gone. Next thing you know. Like, who knows, an, in, an unknown amount of time goes by, especially for a kid. You don't know. And then, boom, you wake up and you're feeling groggy, don't know what drugs are, don't know what's that feeling, you know, just completely awful. So there's that. I have woken up after, you know, an operation in the right. hospital in the ICU. It is a weird feeling right. with tubes attached to you and stuff. It's a very crazy feeling. So that, uh, yeah, I can... I can visualize it, but also the, the other, uh, the thinking that you're awake feeling, if I may, uh, I'll dip into the, the juicy stuff. Uh, I haven't done this very much in my life, but one time, and I will say that the most easily, the most psychedelic thing that I've ever done is salvia. And I'm sure this is no news to anybody in the world that salvia is a crazy thing to do. I don't recommend it for everybody. It gives me a headache. I've tried it only one other time and it didn't even work, but it always gives me a bad headache if I try it at all. So the rest of the night I'll have a bad headache. So I don't like it. Yeah. However, the one time I tried it and it really worked when it was over, or at least I thought it was over, I remember, say, I remember saying to the, one of the people around who had, was not at all high and, and saying, oh, it's okay, it's over now, I'm back, kind of thing. Because when I wasn't back, it was full on, like, out there, not seeing what's in front of my face, like, Technicolor trippy, trippy. Speed Racer uh, racetrack that I was seeing and stuff, like, just complete hallucination, not just in gonzo. the room. And then when I was, could see the room and my friends again, this is a very short time. It's like 10 minute span or whatever, right? Feels like a lot got packed into that 10 minute span that I probably talked about on a different podcast or I will again. But anyway, long story long, the feeling of like kind of coming back, I was like, it's okay, guys, I'm back now. I, I, it's fine. <laughs> like but you just I went to the market like, and came back. But then I remember actually coming back and going, whatever that was that I felt was not back. I wasn't back yet. I thought I was thinking <laughs> completely fine but when i was actually fine i was like well, i don't know what that was it's like you went to i the really market, was convinced that i it was over and came back but you're in the wrong house i, <laughs> I came Wait, back who are you people in the sense that like whatever spirit camera could see me sitting there yeah <laughs> you know That's i was like trippy, oh okay I'm, I'm i'm back but like the feeling was like very much of just a drunk person or something at that point like yeah you're back but you're not really anyway that that so to you know to tie into the feeling of Thinking that you've had this experience and then you actually wake up and the reality of it hits you is a very strange Ugh, feeling. I, I oh, think it's yeah, very messes crazy. with your psyche. Some black mirror business. Yeah, yeah. Where you're just like, and like, I feel like I'll never get over this, which eventually you probably will. Mm-hmm. It'll kind of get pushed that down. That actually, but... when, when I think of it that way, I, I don't know what I was thinking before, but I couldn't really put my own psyche into it. When we were talking two episodes ago about the neuroscientist who wants to try and reset people's minds back to before the, their injury. To Correct. Fix them lsd and such yes right with with psychedelic drugs like yes if i think about the experience i had just with salvia and the amount of like even just an, a regular experience with uh as a child with anesthetic and waking up the the amount of like messing with your brain that can be done is pretty powerful like i actually kind of really think that lady might be onto something there you can definitely reprogram neuro paths i think yeah and then you can make you it's like, very powerful we can compete with know. ai maybe 
uh, <laughs> compete with AI. It's not about that, dude. No, it's but, about living the best life. Hopefully, it's but with seeing that. what was always there. You have to trust the people that are uh, working on the car, though, on the engine. Like, like take you know it to the good auto body shop. You don't want people going and messing with your engine. Oh my god, and they no. don't know what they're doing. No. They're just hitting with a hammer. <laughs> and that's essentially you. what you're doing when you're messing with stupid drugs and stuff like that. Right, like, I, right. I don't know, right? Like, okay, people have done it before and been fine, but at the same time, that was craziest thing i've ever seen without anything you know that wasn't really there that was like a lucid or not even lucid dream it's like being forced into a dream suddenly where you can't really move very well i remember feeling I mean, like not I forced, had you. arms that were being held back i had the impression yeah. that i had four arms with tentacles all holding me back to a bed and stuff that was a weird Jeez, dude that's geez, a yeah, the craziest that's a thing i've ever done Locked for sure 100 100 100 totally anyway um, um <laughs> <laughs> Dude, those guys are rad, whoever they are. Those guys anyway. are rad. Yeah. Um, so that's uh, that's a pretty crazy story for you. Um, anyway, the thing that yeah. I think is with, with the brain that you're saying, though, is just one of those things that, like, how do you work on a computer that is currently on, and if you unplug something mm-hmm. and fuck it up, it's dead. You know what I mean? It's one of those things that you can't really mess around with too much. Mm-mm. The brain. No. And everybody's so, is different, by the way, you know, a little yeah. bit and stuff like that. So, And we haven't even figured out like, what, 80% of it? Or we're not even know, using man. 80% of it or something yeah, like right, that? Yeah, right, man. I'm using like at least 11%. Right? At least. Just yeah, kidding. but yeah, at least 11%. No. All right, here's another crazy story. It's a very small amount, by the way. We really don't use that much of our brain. It's like something know. really lower than five, I think. Here's another crazy, quacky coma story. That doesn't. That seems like I'm making light of crazy shit, but these people are all around to tell the story, so I think it's, like, cool. Kooky coma stories from Whoa. Comapedia. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, my up. husband was in a 28-day coma when we were teenagers and just friends. He doesn't remember a thing, but his heart rate would skyrocket when we would visit, so we were told we had to leave. Oh. It's kind of cute. Hmm. I mean, in a coma way or, you know, <laughs> just being around him, like stressed him out so much yeah. that he, his heart rate would elevate. Boner. And the doctor's yeah. like, you got to get out of here. And he's flatlining. And yeah. oh, as soon as they walked away, he was like, <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. Um, here's another one. My Nana was in a coma for two months. She, she thought it was the seventies when it was really 2004. She remembered some of us as we were back then. And Sounds some like not lucky, at all. The lucky one. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's, Said she was with her dead parents also, as well as her twin who died at birth. Wacky. She had severe agoraphobia after that. Hmm. Oh. I guess the only problem with that is the conflict with reality that might happen. You know, like she really believes in something that's not going to well, happen. What's real? Or... It's Black Mirror. Totally. That's the best R- way to describe right. it. Right. Like, so, but, but it depends on how immersed in that reality she is. If she just fully is like happily believing these certain things, then you know what? There could be worse fates, I guess. But right. it depends on how often that led her to do disappointment. Like, why didn't they come over and stuff like that? Then that, there's all kinds of sad stuff. Like they died 30 years ago. Of. Yeah, exactly. Right. Well, yeah. You know, I mean, so. I guess that's like the same thing to be said with like, uh, what is it? Alzheimer's? Yep. You're kind Any of just in a state of, of what the fuck dementia. Yeah. Yeah. Always, which is frightening. Really, really you the just... scariest and saddest. One of at least the scariest and saddest things that we could ever think of is, is <laughs> being clueless and mind. dizzy. Yeah. And just like, you don't know who anybody is that you're with. And yeah, it's crazy. Okay. I got one more good one until we move on to the next one. Uh, the next. Whatever. S- category. Segment. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. The next segment. There we go. Thank you. That's the word I was looking for. Um, I was in a very bad car accident and shattered multiple bones, and I almost bled out. I don't remember anything except a few seconds of the accident itself. I was asleep for about 48 hours afterward, and it was completely blank for me. When I woke up, I knew I had been in an accident, and my parents talked to me through what happened. After the dreams I had, while still in the hospital, were weird. Because I was on heavy opioid painkillers and both my legs were broken. I had many dreams in which I was running. Then I'd jerk awake, subconsciously wanting to move my legs. I'd never liked running so it was also completely unique to me my, my situation then so maybe that that was the guy's brain's trauma response to i don't know direct focus towards the legs because that was where all the trauma was yeah i guess know? yeah it, was, it just knew that that was the hindered part so it was just a lot of yeah attention down there maybe that's just the like ultra dramatic like magnified version of what our brains always do like if we suffer kind of like a micro trauma during the day like we're stressed out about being late maybe the dreams we might have later whether we remember them or not might have something to do with like oh i'm late right now or oh somebody's waiting and i'm letting them down or, or something is stressful you know like it may stress it, dream it, yeah. it always manifests later in your dream and then they also say that it 
manifests in your stomach too. Like stress apparently can manifest in really weird ways where if you have like a really traumatic incident, say, say somebody who witnessed, I don't know, like a bank robbery incident or they got heavy with shotguns and shit right something like that right if they saw something or maybe they saw somebody fall off something at work and it was really and the person got hurt but that you know it doesn't matter something like that or they maybe they got in a yelling match with somebody that that kind of stress although they might be fine for a minute like if they had that adrenaline spike it could actually take up to like a month until it actually manifests with flu-like symptoms Holy you can get fuck. sick to your stomach because of something you saw like a month ago because your brain is processing it in a weird way. That is not, uh, this is just something I heard. And that's it's trippy, dude. That's cool. Well, it's not cool. Crazy, that sucks. Right? I think that's actually happened to me. Right. You, you kind of have to like, maybe it takes a week to process what happened. And then finally you just feel this weight hit you. Like you've got almost like a fever, White. you got chills, yeah. you got a, ma- a big headache and your neck is stiff. That could be because you had a fight with your boss a week ago. It's crazy. Don't stress forget is the number one about killer, man. stress. Like yeah. it can actually hold inside your stomach and it holds in your stomach and then your gut biome suffers and oh, it's crazy. Yeah, dude. It's uh yeah, stress is the number one killer and it's one of those things that's like stop stressing. You're going to hurt yourself. Stop. And it's like I know, but how like some some people like I I I I'm slowly learning ways to cope with my stress because I I'm a candidate of taking on way too much. And figuring it out later how to do it all. And then the figuring it out is literally just me stressing about it all mm-hmm. and running around, not having a good time, kind of just in this like trance zooming through shit. And it's like, well, I mean, it's easier said than done. But I mean, if there's anything to be said when you're 80 and you look back and you just basically zombie moded through a bunch of shit because you stress yourself out with too much, you're going to be like, why? I mean, there's some things you can't help and there's some things you got to do, especially if you're grinding, but you got to take saw, care of yourself. I saw a documentary. Actually, I only saw a little bit of it because I was just eating and stuff or whatever. But the beginning of this wicked documentary about a record store in Toronto called Play de Record. And uh, this guy was from Trinidad, the guy who ran it. And all throughout his life, he had guys coming through there. Basically, everybody in the biggest names in hip hop, you know, Maestro, Fresh, Wes, guys like that level of Canadian hip hop just coming through his place constantly and not just hip hop stuff either EDM people that I have no idea you know he had a, a guy sending him stuff from France that you couldn't get anywhere else and all this stuff this little cool record store that they could have sold rock and roll and stuff like that to be mainstream like but like a lot of the bigger uh, record stores in Toronto were selling that anyway and another thing that was cool about them is they opened up uh, a, their store in the back of a store, which most places in that day and age didn't want to do in, in a brick and mortar store. Everybody shopped in the front. You want a, your store in the front, but they were willing to take the cheaper rent in the back and all the underground MCs and DJs all knew this is where you get hot records right now. This is like the, the first place you get them. So everybody would be like, like emerging filling artists. up this place, this play to record in Toronto yeah. and all these guys, Shock Lair, Socrates, all these guys, you know, Cardinal, Official, all the names that you heard, the Rascals, those guys are all coming through there. Chaos. Um, and this guy, but the point of my long story here is that this guy didn't even, he was saying in the interview, I didn't really stop and like think about like the effect that we had on this. I didn't even think we had an effect or that it was important at all until you guys came and wanted to make this documentary. And then I start thinking, well, yeah, I saw them every week. Like these yeah. guys, it was no big deal to me to see them. Cause I see them every week, actually every, you know, they're like, Oh, what's it's new? What's new? What's new? It's part of his business. And then he said he didn't even stop and realize that he had this massive effect on basically helping put Canada on the map of hip hop throughout the nineties and early two thousands. Super dope. And then when they came and wanted to make like a Netflix or a, you know, an Amazon or whatever documentary yeah, for him, right. he's like, Oh, I guess we did do something You're good here. Right. And a little like, bit. Yeah, me. I guess. That's so sweet. sometimes I guess people never get that guy coming and knocking on your door with a documentary saying, Hey, you did something awesome. Right. Some right. people just fucking have their head down nonstop. Yeah. Never realize that they did anything cool. So you got to find a balance. There's also plenty of people out there patting themselves on the back for nothing. Also, yeah, which yeah. is stupid, but yeah, I got you, up and you don't want to have imposter syndrome to the point of where you're not, or just be so stressed and so like preoccupied that you've stretched yourself so thin. You can't even stop and realize that like legends are in your store every week. Right. Well, I mean, that ends up happening, especially for a lot of the people that have to grind. Like, I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm sure everybody in some sense, has enough of um that that make it somewhere have enough has enough drive in some form i don't want to like write off everybody but the people that don't have connections or the people that don't have um like they literally are homegrown organic by themselves 
made them some them them something by themselves. Those are the people that really are in overdrive and on kind of autopilot. And then they like look up after a while and then they're just like, oh yeah, wow, I actually did accomplish something. Like, like, I mean, I'm not saying that I've done anything crazy in my life, but I've done some cool stuff and I need to like sit back and appreciate it rather than like, oh, I, I why both. I haven't done any of the sh- the shit I wanted to do yet. It's like, wait, I actually have. I just haven't appreciated it. Mm-hmm. And then but I'm stressing because I'm not actually realizing where i'm at and what i'm doing and yeah. it's just it's but the thing is is you're, if you keep doing that you'll go on forever with your head down stressed out and Comparing your tummy's gonna and, take it <laughs> right so you're yeah you gotta you gotta take a bit of it both like i've said before it's not easy to do, to even just to get where we are right now with all the equipment and all the you know the money and things that we've done just to get a podcast and the point was always just to have a podcast so we could have our friends like dan hitchin and chris and stuff and ben come hang out and we did we did fucking yeah. do it right like so as much as it is, we want to improve. That's a good thing too. Like we always that that dissatisfaction feeling, like I've said before, is the is the good thing. That's like actually fire. we should. It's the fire in your belly that right. makes you hungry that makes us make more of these. If we right. were just completely one hundred percent content, it would it would we be hard. It. Yeah, it would be hard to show up <laughs> here again and be like, yeah, but I'll just listen to that other podcast we already did. You know, like what? But I mean, there's yeah, long you know. like a good summed up way of how I look at that is like appreciate where you're at and what you've got. Um, Stress is only gonna is only gonna make your life just a void of of a, a dark tunnel of where the fuck was I? Because like a week, a month, a year could go by, and you just don't even realize it because you've just been so focused and transfixed on one thing that you're trying to achieve rather than appreciating stuff. And at the end of the day, at the end of the line, we're all gonna get there. You're gonna look back and be like, "Yo, what actually was I doing? And why was I so stressed out all the time?" And that comes out on other people that we love or this, that, the other thing too. So anyways, yeah, long story short, stress is the biggest killer. You know, well, it's like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and appreciate. Yeah. Here, I'm going to probably, yeah, I think, I don't know if it was a podcast or what I heard it on, but it's like this dude, his name is, um, Shrilp or something, Shrip, Brant, Brampton Shrilp or something. Anyway, he's, um, he was a detective, I think. And he ended up having to go in and the part of this is a, it's almost like a, not a parable, just like a moral of the story kind of thing. But, He's on a crime scene, one of the crime scenes, and a guy who had been, um, it was like either a murder scene or just a that I don't remember, something like that. Pardon me to say the word, a self-death. Um, and uh, they're going around it was this furniture store. It's like a furniture store, or like if it has antique furniture, but a, a lot of it still has like this weird, like a, it's like they reupholster there, but they're looking at this type of, leather or whatever that it's like reupholstered with their yeah. couches their sure. high back chairs and stuff like totally. that anyway brampton shrilp is in there he's like going through he's like putting exhibit a exhibit b whatever and they send some of the stuff back to the lab um and they're interviewing some of the people around the place there's like an old lady there that claims like all she ever used to hear is this sort of like tapping sound or yeah. whatever it's like yeah the guy's upholstering things um so anyway, I guess they, they like got it back to the lab. They figured out that the tapping was like him trying to figure out how to hammer down this thin leather. And when they started clearing out a bunch of the leather and stuff, one of the guys that came in there, his name was um, Cormuckle, something Cormuckle. Anyway, he started like, he looked at the wall. There's a bunch of string all over like that. And it looked like it was just being tanned on the wall, this like big weird strip of leather. Yeah. But it turned out it was like, he's like, well, no, it's obviously it's a map, right? And so he's like, they're like, holy shit, it looks like a map. This dude had like made, had like sewn up like a giant map or whatever. Holy fuck. And it started like moldering at the edges. There's like this weird green fuzzy shit gross. around the edges. Super gross. But at the same time, they're like, no, that's like this forest in this one area. Right. So he's been using this like weird mold. They're like, what is this? So they get the samples back from the lab three years later or how, no, sorry, three years, like months later or whatever. Right, right, right. It turns out that it's like a, a species of like California Florida or Florida, California. Um, it's um oranges and orange peels. He's been stapling. He's the they call him the the orange stapler. <laughs> the orange stapler. Yeah. Ah. Uh. It's the case of the orange stapler. That's it's yeah. Brampton Shrilp and the orange stapler. That's beautiful, man. That was a Ellery good- Clemington wrote that. Um, Ellery Clemington in the it was like. After it was lesser known because Dickens overshadowed that uh, Ellery, yeah. Ah, Orange State. <sighs> Ellery St. Bennington went to um, um, Clarice, uh, the what was it, the the Abbey that like Pennystone Abbey where uh-huh. where they would learn, all the monks would learn. Uh, okay, yeah. 
You just threw me for a loop, dude. <laughs> <laughs> so that leads us to the next segment. <laughs> I I'm was sorry. just like, <gasps> it was hard. I. <laughs> So we have a we're we're gonna we're gonna do a segment now, which he just he just uh kind of uh intelligently uh, did I ruin it? Do it? No, that was I don't know really what. Cool. Okay, I'll be honest. I didn't know what he wanted me to do. So so basically, <laughs> I just I earlier today I told him I'm like, hey, come up with a short story that has something to do with an orange stapler. I actually was <laughs> buying what the fuck he was saying right now for the whole time until he ended it with orange stapler and confused the fuck out of me. I'm like, okay, where are we, where are we going with this? Probably confused the fuck out of everybody listening too. Nobody will like, ever get this except maybe Dylan would laugh. That was like the only reason that I did this. hilarious. I'm but sorry. basically I said, yo, come up with a short story. This is a segment that I kind of want to do where I'm going to give Dan some words, like one or two words. He's going to give me two words and we're just going to come up with a story about it. That was dope. That was <laughs> trippy as fuck. There was a lot of words going on that I was like throwing me around and I was just like, oh, the orange stapler. I get it. I get it. Uh, and then I didn't realize he was actually delving into this sequence. I didn't know how it was going to go either. I, yeah. I freestyled uh, uh, the whole thing. Until he just did it. And he just I morphed. just came up with it on the spot because I knew, wanted to end up with orange stapler somehow. That was the only thing. That right. was very dope. So I just gave I gave him the word orange stapler. Um, we'll come up with a crazy wacky name later. I'm calling these just. Oh, just wait. You, you tell your story and then see if they guess what two words I gave. <laughs> <laughs> um they will not yeah, i'm right. just saying that right now they will not because my story is a bit there. of a it's a bit of a roller coaster that'll oh. make sense in a minute <laughs> but my uh, word was not roller coaster just no it wasn't 100 clearing that up yeah so my my word i was just going to give it out at the beginning is Purple dagger. Purple dagger. Purple dagger is the one. That He's like, has. here, orange stapler. Come up with two or a purple dagger. So it's kind of a writing activity, but it's also a brain game, but it's also just to see what you can do. So I give my fellow podcaster here, Daniel, two words. He makes a story. And then he gives me two words. I make a story. How we come up with it, what we do, doesn't matter as long as we use those two words. That's the segment. Okay. Hooray. I'm about to get into mine. I just want to ingest this so that I can actually be talking into the mic and reading at the same time. Thank you. Man. Creaky. Hello, 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 hello. Hello. Twenty six thirty six is the age of the goats that I have in my farm. What? Twenty six thirty six. Into the future, you're still farming goats in twenty six thirty six. Yes, I'm a future herder. That's optimism right there. That's my. my that's my dream job, man. You think that? Yeah, goat farming in the future is still a thing. I I am hopeful. And he had a purple day. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Oh, all right. We're Was done. I right. telling the story now? Okay. So mine is more um, apparent. It's not as secretive as, as my friend over here, but my story is called The Midnight Carnival. Are you ready for this? No. That's why I said roller coaster earlier. Uh... <laughs> this is a true story. I heard it from a sister of a sister of mine. Dr. Barnaby Johnson was a Zephyrus character. His momentum for Zills was exceptionally higher than the average doctor, but enough of that for now. The year 1928, Barnum and Bailey, big top extravaganza was coming to St. Louis. That meant it was only a five-hour train ride from Chicago, which is where this story takes place. Did you look that up? And Dr. Barnum Johnson lived in Chicago. Yes, I did. <laughs> it is now. In 1928, it probably took a little longer, but... <laughs> it said that. I can't exactly say okay, what Okay, oh, no, yeah. it's believable yeah. Oh, yeah, dude, I did my mm-hmm, research mm-hmm. for this shit. I knew you did. Um, so... Well, the f- I derailed you. I apologize. No, you did, uh, no the, my five storytelling hours, program has is, is derailed me. What a, what, a, what, a, what, a, what a pain in my ass this is being. Okay. The year 1928, Barnum Bailey's big top extravaganza was coming to St. Louis. This meant it was only a five-hour train ride from Chicago, which is where the story takes place, and Dr. Barnum Johnson lived. As tomorrow, being the night the carnival was coming to Chicago and not today, we'll skip to then. It was an exciting day, as Dr. Barnum Johnson, BJ for short, was a stickler. But one soft spot he had was for carnivals. He could let go and be a child for a night. Watch the tight ropers rope tight. Crowley? Oh my god, Crowley. What you- she is so not graceful. Okay, all right. Okay, we're still recording. We're still good. She just, (laughs) she's just fucking around and then fell. (laughs) Man, this is a really good story. I promise. Oh, I know it's a good story. Fuck. Starting right now. Uh. Oh my god, my cat. That's the first time it actually happened, though. Okay. Would you like? (laughs) I was like, I was like nudging her away, but she didn't want to fucking go. And oh man. Normally cats just go. Oh, okay. You want me to go this way? I wonder how that sounds. Anyways, okay. Are you with me so far, or do I have to restart? Uh, 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 go ahead. With what? With the Barnum and Bailey. Okay. Somebody has a soft spot for carnivals. 
As tomorrow being the night the carnival was coming to Chicago and not today, we'll skip to then. It was an exciting day. Dr. Barnum Johnson, BJ for short, was a stickler, but one soft spot he had was for carnivals. He could let go and be a child for a night. Watch the tight ropers rope tights. That's where everything derailed. <laughs> Eat the national food of Chicago. He burrito. Pronounced he burrito. It's a Chicago-born sandwich inspired by the flavors and culinary traditions of Puerto Rico. The burrito combines a protein, usually steak, with garlicky mayonnaise, fresh tomato slices, lettuce, onions, and cheese. Instead of bread, two flat, crispy slices of fried plantains bind the inside. Using plantains in place of bread is a long-standing tradition in Puerto Rico. Juan Pete Figueroa made the dish his own and began serving it in a Chicago restaurant in 1996. Since then, the popular sandwich has earned a place for the menu of many Chicago eateries. Did I say this story took place in 1928? He didn't eat he burritos. He ate cotton candy and deep dish pizza. That's what Chicagoans love. Anyways, and he loved clowns. His stepfather was a clown. He passed away in the great tragic elephant foot race of 1896. But nonetheless, going to the carnival took him to less stressful times before all the open heart surgeries and brain extractions. BJ was washing his hands for his final kidney pump of the day and looked to his office table. A ticket was there for the carnival. But just then he heard a commotion from outside the window. Fire! Fire! That would have been a perfect time for the cat to fall <laughs> and slam everything around. BJ slammed his kidney enema to the floor and rushed to the open window. You boy, what do you speak of the day of the carnival? Well, sir, I was skipping rock at the old trestle and some bully kids pushed me in the river. I hurt myself pretty bad and went to weep behind a tree where a couple of bully kids were fornicating. I learned about the birds and the bees that wonderful evening. Leaving the trestle, I heard a massive crash and it came from the southwest rail yard. I heard what sounded like animals and clown horns and cartoon xylophones all smashing together in a pretty comedic effect. I ran atop the hill and the circus train. She exploded. BJ, looking puzzled, replied to the boy. Sorry, son, you're going to have to repeat that. I didn't catch a word as I am five stories up. The boy ran inside the building and repeated the story to BJ. Oh, now this will surely affect the carnival tonight. I was oh so looking forward to it. The little boy looked stupefied and dumbfounded to BJ. Well, yeah, no shit. BJ looked understood and said the boy on his way. The boy yelled back at BJ. I'll be back next week for my kidney blast appointment. BJ shut the door behind him and spanned the sign to close. He hopped into his jalopy and sped to the rail station. He was in such a rush, he almost clipped the newsboy. It was a near miss and just sprayed jalopy dust all over him. BJ jalopy at the dust? Right... <laughs> jalopy dust. The, the fragments of his vehicle? All over him. Okay. <laughs> BJ at the rail station. How are the tigers? The president of the circus society was signing some papers and said, oh, everyone's all right. It will just delay the circus a couple hours. It will now be a midnight circus. Yep. BJ was thrilled the circus going experience wasn't doomed to be just a fond fantasy. Later that night, the clock tower struck 12. Dong, dong goes the clock tower. BJ hopped into his jalopy and peeled off into the midnight circus. As he was waiting in line, he saw a familiar looking clown walking into a tent. His stare was affixed and he was in total zonedness. A medium voice from the sideline broke that gaze. Ticket, please. Oh. Yes, of, of course. He handed over the ticket and walked into the circus. An announcer said it would be 20 minutes till the show started. Perfect, BJ thought. I've got just enough time to entertain my curiosity. He went into the circus, handmaid's tent, and boffed a real nice. Boffed in 1928 was a slang term for a kidney pump. She said, thank you, doctor, as he left the tent. There he was, the familiar clown. He Charleston boffed his way over to the man in makeup and fur and asked his name. Why, it's Jub-Jub, sir. Honk, honk. He bejangled his clown horn. You look like someone I know. Wipe that face now. I demand it. The clown bezazzled BJ with seltzer water from his clown blaster and tried to take off into the night. BJ was all, an all-county track star in his heyday and had pretty pumped legs to chase down a clown. He caught up to him in a nearby field and grabbed Jub-Jub by his clown trousers. The trousers snapped and comedically fell to his ankles. All that was there in the middle of the field was a doctor and a sad clown naked from the waist up. There was a tattoo on the clown's forearm. It was a purple dagger. Are, are you part of the purple dagger Chicago chapter? Yes, Jub Jub exhaled. And now that you know my cover, you have to have the traditional yellow, yellow dra dagger slit across your abdomen. Yellow? No, no, wait. Who are you? I'm your stepfather, damn it. You weren't supposed to find out. There was no elephant foot race. It was all a ruse. I joined the secret midnight society of the purple daggers and none shall know who we are lest we ram him with a yellow dagger. But I can spare your life if you agree to be an initiate and come with me to the secret midnight camp. Do I have a choice, Papa? No, now come with me. Part one concludes. 
All right. Well, I've got so many three questions. <laughs> so, how was that for Purple Dagger? <laughs> it's basically what I thought you would say. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty much. I hope that story makes almost. sense. Yeah. Uh, no, actually, I hope it doesn't make sense, but for all the right reasons, not because mm-hmm. my cat had to derail everything in the what middle it does, of it. Yeah. What <laughs> does make sense about it is that it was definitely just scre- stream of consciousness. You did a scream of consciousness. Sure yeah. was. That's what I like to do. Stream of consciousness writing is one of those writings where we just go. You just write what comes out. That's it. No, no time to look back. I like scream better. Scream of consciousness. Scream of consciousness. Yeah. It's dope, man. That's Silent scream. Yeah. That's dope. So, so I had purple dagger. Yes, there's going to be a part two. Yes, you are looking forward to it. And yes, we will get to meet the orange stapler. And yes, and the, the orange ne- stapler too. How could we forget? <laughs> Rodney if, Cormuckle or whatever. Yeah, you're like, you're like, it was believable because you were forgetting names. So I don't know if that was part of your act or if that was part of you. Being or just stoned. I wanted to come up with the dumb, stupid, like, f- like fake names in order to remember. I wrote Brampson Cormuckle, Ellery Talp, Tolp Talp, uh, and the Orange Stapler. Are these real that names? Was, that was all I wrote. No, that, that's yes, they're very real. These are my friends. They're my friends. These are my friends. Um, and to round this all up, do you have anything else you want to add to this lovely stream of consciousness, psychosis, Dude, nightmare you can't dream? Add to this. I've got one last segment. It's called Human Error, and it's stupid ideas. Okay, uh, excellent. It's it's actually like stupid inventions. Ideas. I got a couple inventions here that were real and actually made it to. These are real. These aren't just a bunch of nonsense words stapled together. So you can steal them and rework them. That's right. These are actually things that people tried to do, and it didn't work for very obvious reasons because they were just bad ideas. So there is one called the family bike. You've now seen a monocycle and you've probably seen a tandem bike, a bike fit for two. But how about one that fits four? The family bicycle was invented in 1939 by Charles Steinluff to cart his daughter, wife and son around town. It required the person on the back to pedal, the person up top to steer via a wheel. So he was up like top. above <laughs> the, the other two to, in position to hold tight. A sewing machine was actually placed in the middle of the bike where Steinloff would keep sewing, Mrs. Steinloff, the wife, uh, during demonstrations. So basically, this bike looks like a triangle. If you can picture a triangle with I, I, two, yeah. two wheels, and in between the two wheels, there's a desk. And above that desk, there's a person steering. So she's got like a sidecar where she's facing the middle of the frame of the bike and, and just doing some sewing. Just patching Yeah, so it there's up. four people, Good and it's, they're no all potholes. in a triangle formation. The dad is on top. And his ass is in his son's face. So yeah. imagine your dad just Great. had those Chicago style burrito things I was talking about. What the fuck those were? Blast an ass. Well, you're the one doing all the work. There's one person pedaling. Yeah. So. Yeah. This guy sounds like a great guy. You just I don't keep understand. Sewing. You guys pedal. I'll steer. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. You yeah. three little, little children. And then there's just one little girl at the front just having the time of her life sitting doing fuck all. <laughs> but uh, tight. That was, uh, yeah, that was a, a real bike that they tried and failed. Yeah. You successfully know how many bikes failed. there probably have been that are real? I'm tr- I just, you know, my, that my have brain. successfully I, failed? I just pictured, uh, <laughs> when you said the family bike, I pictured uh, like a five or six person bike that uh, you can get them in five or sixes, whatever hexagonal, but they're all the seats are back to back, like in a sort of a, a circle or an octagon so that all the bikes are facing away from each other. Right. So that whoever's the strongest in the family gets to choose which direction you go. You pedals, whoever pedals harder gets to drag the rest of the apparatus. <laughs> That's real. <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't, I hope not. Oh, that was the next one on my list. <laughs> oh yeah. 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 <laughs> You're the getting ahead of me again. <laughs> uh, no, the next one on my list is actually electrified water. If you've ever had too good of a time out, people have made that far too often before. Electrified water? Yeah, they've invented that before. It's called oh, Gatorade, okay? Electrolyte water? Yeah, oh, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. You, do your Go. thing. No, what? this is actually not electrolytes, electrified. If you like got out and got blottoed and you were hungover is essentially what this was for and needed to get rid of a headache the next morning, you could have tried electrified water. The product was advertised as the best treatment for the morning after. Fortunately, it wasn't as dangerous as it sounds. The electric current stopped surging through the water before you dipped your hands into it. But this still seems like an accident waiting to happen. Though the early 1900s, people thought electrified water was good for drinking, watering plants, and cleaning clothes without soap. In fact, in 1913, the Albuquerque Morning Journal ran an ad for the Imperial Laundry, which stated that had solved the problem of absolutely sterilizing your clothes without the use of chloride or lime. They used electrified water. So it's literally like this uh, random thing with two wires dipping into your water bowl. 
and it like is like putting an electric current through the water. Okay, that sounds like a self harm. Here's machine. a dumb. Here's where I feel silly. Uh, it raises the question of like, if you do electrify water like that, does it kill all the bacteria in it, or is it? Are they I mean, that's what they grounded? were trying to get like, you to think. That's what I mean. But it also sounds like. Can I, you and the other thing water? is, how does the current stop when you put your hands in? Like, how does well, it know? There's no. I don't know. There's got to be some sort of fail safe. Maybe they lit it. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't work <laughs> unless you have the lid closed. I don't know. I don't Charles, know. All I know is that I feel silly. could you turn off the electrifier? I'm putting my hands in it now. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to wash my face what, now. What, dear? <laughs> blah, blah, blah. <laughs> i got to wash my Jesus. face. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, that was a real thing. I don't know why I don't know that. I feel like it would zap all the bacteria in there, but also, like, why don't we just sterilize water that way? I don't know. Weird. But, like, like have right. you, you never heard of toaster in the bathtub? Yeah, but it reminds kills me of you. Yeah, but does it? I don't know. I don't know. That's what they're trying to make you think. It's I mean, not a machine, have elect- I, I feel like a big idiot, but they have electricity in places that need sterile water. Why don't they just like zap the water with these tong things and then it's fine? I'm guessing because it wasn't I real and the science wasn't there. I'm guessing. No, but, but the science that we have, I mean, mm. where regular electricity zaps water. That's all mm. I'm saying. Oh. Why? I don't know. I have to look into this. I feel very dumb. I will. I will. Yeah. It, will yeah. that sterilize water? I, I look water? forward Somebody to your me. findings. Where's Dan? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Explain regular science to me, please. But on the next thing of science, we got dog condiments. Fortunately, the condiment is not made from dogs, but made for them, which is oh. obviously what we thought. Okay. When your dog is a finicky eater for his kibble and just needs a little razzle-dazzle, pour one of the Petchup's dog condiments. The company offers Petchup, mustard, <laughs> mutton-aise, and barbecue sauce. Why is this not a thing? For your furry friend, despite the names, each condiment is actually meat-flavored. It's hard to yeah. tell if this product is a joke or genius, but for just twenty four forty, you can snag a bottle and find out. That's What's very expensive. What's the matter? Okay, if it's overpriced, it's one thing, but like, don't you want your dog to enjoy his food? Yeah. Why is it's why is treat. condiments Treats and exist. extras only for humans? Why yeah. can't dogs have razzle dazzle in their food? I'll be honest, I do that for my cat right now. She was so skinny when we got her that we started feeding her those little tubes, those like. Uh, oh yeah, the squeeze ups. Yeah, the little squeeze. Yeah, tubes. my my cat's had a couple, and my my girlfriend's cat loves so them. So we just squeeze it on top of her other food, and she goes nuts for it. It's like cat condiment. What's a? It's not crazy. These people are smart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But apparently, apparently, this. I mean, that one's a fun one, and should I just think the price is outrageous? Almost thirty bucks. For a bottle of ketchup. Okay, sure. But it depends how much you're putting on it. How big is the bottle? Especially that's USD. Yeah, maybe that's fair. You're not supposed to put a ton of it on, just like regular ketchup. <laughs> I made my dog obese. <laughs> um, And then the last one I got on this list, which is hilarious. It looks like a baby slingshot. It's called the two-parent baby carrier. Am I a horrible person that like the first thing that I thought of when you said inventions that they said wouldn't work and that they got rid of? You thought that when I said baby slingshot, you thought you were a horrible that. person? I mean, that self-explanatory it, is not a I good idea. Uh, an invention that nobody needs. I'm like, oh, a way to fling children. That nobody needs it, right? That's the first. I don't know. Yeah, that's that's precisely why it's <laughs> on this list. The two parent baby, but it's the two parent baby carrier. So it's like you know, Snugglies. You've heard of the genius idea, uh-huh. Snuggly. It's like a basically a little baby character, like a Bjorn, like in ha- uh, Hangover. How's it different? Because this is for parents that are obviously no longer in love with each other anymore, and. They fight about absolutely everything. It's like, it's your turn to carry the baby. No, it's your turn. Why don't we just both do it? And they Oh, yeah, actually, they should totally both be handling the infant if they're fighting. It like literally, that. it's like it straps onto one of their shoulders and then uh, the man's shoulders and the woman's shoulders and the baby sits in between. It's crazy. So and, that when the ice cream truck starts playing music and Buddy's like, oh, and yeah. just runs. Or know? like you're walking down the sidewalk. So like literally, it's, it's there's a woman, a baby in the middle, and a man. And the and baby you need a third person to operate to the sling. Yes. Yeah. The yeah. baby's in the middle attached to both the, the mom and the dad. And if you're trying to think right now, how does that work? It works. It's and like, it's like It's like they're on a swing. The baby's on a swing but between what happens these if two you're walking, yeah. Yeah, What happens if you're walking down the sidewalk and a skateboarding dude, obviously this was kind of before skateboard. This is 1937. But I digress. Somebody's walking down. Pick a side, little dude. Or biking. All biking down. Your child. And it's like you go to, to move off the sidewalk one way. Mom goes the other way, and guess who's in the middle? Still in the middle because he's got the two parents that can't figure out their shit out. Damn it. <laughs> no. Baby gets nailed by biker. I'm, I've had enough. I've had enough That's of this. That's it. No more of this has to stop. It yes. has to stop. So, it has yeah. got to quit. People stop with it. All right? Wait. No, they don't do this. No, they don't. Okay. These, are all, these are all failed inventions. Everybody keep not doing this. 
Jack Milford, a player for the British hockey team with the Wembley Monarchs, invented this carrying device circa 1937. He wanted to skate around the rink with his wife and infant and apparently didn't think to bring the family's baby carriage. The baby carrier looked a bit like a swing, but the child puts both its legs through the holes. Only the child was far too small for it. It was definitely a clever solution to some on-ice family bonding, but it looked like a baby Mm. could topple out at any moment. It's probably for the best that this invention never took off. Yeah, and just the fact that, like, if you wanted to go one way and the other person wanted to go the other way, there's where does baby go? There's, you know, baby goes nowhere. 38 very similar reasons why you don't want to just have yeah. this. You know, one person's probably enough to carry the tiny child. Yep. 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 For well, sure. I'm out of bullets. If there's anything else you have to wrap this dog up, the Chicago man. style dog, man. I don't know. Got all kinds of things. Trying to get ready to go camping up at Gabriola Island. Heck this, yeah, BC, uh, BC, Victoria, Canada. My cat just had surgery, but she's doing okay now. She just got spayed. Little homie got spayed. Bob Little Barker's proud. Spayed. Bob Barker. Um, know, that kind of thing. There's all kinds of stuff uh, coming down the pipe. Is there here. anything you want to talk about that's crazy, relevant, and or buzzwords? <laughs> We're dropping music all the time. My my, uh, my homie's dropping music. Yeah, always dropping music. I'll do the I'll do the plug if you like uh, weird uh, synthwave, metal, industrial, hip hop kind of weird music that you never heard before. Then check out information in dot formation. I've been making lots of drops, and chances are that you, uh, if you know me or you follow me, then you probably see that. So thank you for your support. And if but you're that's in, about it. what's new, we've been dropping. If lots you're somewhere of else in the world, information. He's making music and um, it's spelled with uh, everywhere that uh, an I is, it's a one. And everywhere that an O is, it's a zero in thing, dot yeah. formation. It's very computer savvy tech. Yeah, words. We're super cyberpunk uh, techno space warlocks. Hell yeah. Well, if there's nothing else, uh, no, no crazy stories, else. no Just, monumental things, I think that's it. There's a, uh, I hope I'll my story made something. sense and didn't scare anybody off. Oh. They're, they're gone. They're g- <laughs> There's no one. We're not talking to anyone anymore because of your scary story. A scary story. Wait, yeah. what was it again? It was this. What was the scary story again? The Midnight Society. Nope, no, the no, Midnight no, Circus. No, I can't remember the segment I thought of. It was like a spooky story or something. That we will talk about next time when he can we'll remember. Talk about it next time. That's right. Okay. You'll hear it because I recorded it. So, okay. You'll hear it. No, they won't. They've left. I told you they're gone. <laughs> we scared them all. Okay, anyys okay, Peace out, y'all. Love y'all. You are our friends. We are your friends. These are my friends. Have a good start to July, people. Peace. Peace. Uh, welcome to an evening with uh, uh, Jen- Jen- Jennings Frost. I am Jennings Frost. Uh, come gather close by the fire. I am Jennings Frost. And I will serenade you with my crooner's voice in this 1942 log cabin. My gramophone, you were but recently invented. Most people have to pay a great deal of money for tape. So that they can record their voices in 1942. <laughs> that was uh, what was uh, Blinknap Frost uh, with his father's song of the woods. Perhaps it louder, so you can hear the spittle rattling in the back of my throat as I speak to you. I, Belknap Frost, here seated wow. in my high-backed chair, surrounded by 33 of my favorite cats. All right, let me know when you're ready. I'm ready. Off. I've always been ready. This is going to be one of those no-nonsense ones, I think.